Welcome to the Biodiversity Informa Information Standards or TADWIG 2020 conference. This is Symposium 5 entitled Using Collections to Mitigate and Prevent Zoonotic Disease, Data Mobilization and Integration. My name is Pam Soltis and I'm one of the moderators for this session. My co-moderator is Deb Paul and we will moderate this session together. I'd like to begin with some housekeeping comments. First, we are extremely grateful for the tech support provided by Holly Little, Brenda Daly, and Quentin Groom. The session will be recorded for later viewing. Thank you all for joining us and thank you to all of the speakers in this session. We'll begin the session with a short introduction and that will be followed by three talks and then time for your questions and insights. Please put your questions in the Google Doc. You can see the link in the chat or else in the chat directly using a forward slash question as a prefix so that we can easily spot the questions. The chat function has been made available for technical questions or for conversing with other attendees. Please use this function judiciously as any nefarious or inappropriate use of the chat may result in you being removed from the session or the chat function being disabled. Please see our code of conduct document that, um, that you all agreed to abide by as you registered for the conference. Also, just a reminder, everyone, please keep your microphones muted. And finally, please bear with us in case there are any technical difficulties that we may have. Please also be sure to thank all of the volunteers and session organizers and please enjoy the event. Thanks, Pam. And with that, it's your turn to share your screen. Right. Um, so I'd like to um, first of all, give a brief introduction and then um, we'll get into our slides. So the COVID-19 pandemic, zono zoonoses and pathogens in general provide key opportunities to highlight the predictive value of collections and the information that specimens and related materials may contribute to our understanding of disease origins and transmission. These materials may include such things as genetic and genomic data, associated species data, species and in interaction information, trait data, and much more. Now, harnessing these diverse data sources can contribute to issues such as ecological understanding, tracking the origin and transmission of disease, policy development, and global infrastructure needs. The current pandemic also highlights and has in fact already encouraged much needed cross-disciplinary collaboration and the impetus to advance changes needed in standards of practice. For these reasons, representatives from several organizations, including the Society for the Preservation of Natural History Collections, or SPINACH, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, or GBIF, IDIG Bio, PenSoft, PLASI, and Global Biodiversity, uh, or Global Biotic Interactions, or GLOBI, along with relevant domain scientists, joined the COVID-19 task force convened by CTAF and DISCO to identify both short-term responses and longer-term prediction and mitigation roles for these communities. At the same time, representatives from Spinach, IDIG Bio, the Natural Sciences Collections Association and the US Mammalogy, Virology and Disease Ecology communities formed the Viral Muse Task Force. Ongoing efforts show data and knowledge gaps for pathogens and their hosts, as well as possible solutions for data integration. And behind these data integration efforts are needs for standards development and adoption. Most important, these task forces have identified the need to break down silos and form networks between communities to enable new developments. In our symposium today, we will explore multiple activities of the biodiversity community in the fight against COVID-19. And the first talk will be given by um, Deb and myself in a sort of non-traditional tag team presentation. So hopefully you can all see that and I will turn things over to Deb. Hi everyone. 
Uh, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Uh, something that's affecting all of us uh, locally to globally and certainly in all aspects of our lives. So I'd like to share a little bit and Pam as well with what uh, we've discovered in this process and, and learned and are learning together. So a lot happened right in the last eight months and we all know we have so much information across our community and so much knowledge. Um, but all of this data and the different groups that have it or, or know about it, all of these efforts are not connected in ways that are the most fruitful um, or are complete showstoppers for the kind of things we know we want to be able to do. And therefore, we knew it was time to act. So these are just a short list of some of the things we've been actively involved in or recognize that we need to uh, continue to act on. And so, of course, to do that work, we are Zooming a lot. One way in, in which we've been active uh, using a task force approach, the Consortium for European Taxonomic Facilities and the Distributed System of Scientific Collections, affectionately DISCO, uh, formed a task force and put out a call to the community. Many members joined and I called up and said, we need to be at this task force. And they said, yes, please. And so here we all are. And these were the four uh, targets of the group. So in brief, to reach out to the research community who do, does this kind of work and ask them, what are the questions that need to be asked? What do we need to investigate? And, and that research will be published, uh, followed by a group that's tackling looking at viral evidence improvements and how it's uh, vouchered and how it's linked to this, the samples, as well as uh, work to gather information and in, link it in new ways. And in the last talk of this session, you'll be hearing a bit more about that. And in the last one, you'll be hearing more about today, um, doing something about the data that gets uh, submitted to uh, GenBank, uh, ENA, et cetera, in terms of genetic material being linked to the specimens and the viral sequences uh, so that those relationships are maintained. So on, the, on this side of the pond, um, I reached out to a couple people and said, what, what can we do in our sphere of influence? And out of that was born a task force, Viral Muse. And Pam, would you tell us a little bit more about what we've been doing in Viral Muse? Sure. So um, we began Viral Muse with some conversations. We needed to get to know each other. The group was made up of a sort of eclectic um, assemblage of botanists. Um, mammologists, virologists, disease ecologists, and various other representatives from the natural history community, as well as um, a few people who actually represented um, uh, their interests from the CDC. So in the course of our discussions, uh, we realized that there was a message that we wanted to convey to the broader community. And so we contacted uh, the journal Bioscience and asked if they would be interested in us um, developing a short piece as a viewpoint. And they were interested. We developed the paper and it was published in June. And um, this was a paper that um, Joe Cook led, but we had a large international group of authors. And um, it was really um, a wonderful experience working with all of these people to put the paper together. Now, of course, bioscience is a widely read scientific journal, but there's a bigger issue out there and that has to do with the public. And so we contacted the conversation to see if they might be interested in working with us to develop a piece that would be published there and that would reach a much larger audience. And in fact, that paper um, reached something like 10,000 people within the first week. So there was a huge number of reads, much larger than anything that we ever do in our regular scientific work. Now, another activity that we undertook early on uh, was um, development of an updated directory of genetic resources repositories. As we think about genetics and the um, necessity of archiving genetic sequences along with host specimens, it of course is important that we might be able to uh, find those possible genetic resources. And 
So um, IDIG Bio uh, several years ago had developed a directory for collections located in the US but this hadn't been updated in several years. And so we worked with members of the Viral Muse um, uh, group in order to be able to update this. And particularly John Dunham and um, Joe Cook were instrumental in helping us gather the information. And this is work that was largely done by a graduate student at the University of Florida, an RA for IDIG Bio, Maria Cortez. Now, in the context of the CTAF uh, DISCO task force, one of the main activities was to consider the metadata requirements for genetic sequences. And this is the, um, the working group that I spent most of my time being affiliated with. As part of this effort, we reviewed the high level metadata requirements definitions basically across the main um, data um, resources that contribute to the international um, genetic databases. So this includes NCBI from the US, ENA from Europe and DDBJ from Japan. Now, we're, we've also been providing guidance and tools to capture these metadata. So we had discussions with representatives from GenBank about the uh, format of identifiers um, for voucher specimens, for example. This is a, a widespread issue that could um, certainly help with um, pulling different sorts of data together, not just in the context of the um, COVID-19, but also in a much broader um, scale. And um, we were happy to, with uh, the outcome of these discussions because they're willing to accept genomics um, data um, in, in formats such as URIs. We also uh, worked with the RDA and contributed to their genomics report. And we've been working with um, an FDA led project called Phage4 to um, develop new materials. And so um, basically we think that if we can solve these data issues for COVID related use cases, we can make progress on much larger scales. And I've just indicated that in, in addition to Deb and myself, um, some of the other folks who were active players in this part of the task force. Deb. Hi, everybody. Um, so there's three, potentially four takeaways here, and we're going to go through these rather quickly, but um, I think many of us here in this community are aware of the potential in the data that we have, the expertise that we have. Um, but the question is, how this perpetual question we ask ourselves to ensure that the knowledge we have uh, and the data that we have is both recognized and included that we are at the table. So do we need public relations? How do we do this and whose help do we engage? Another takeaway would be engaging um, with public health community as part of this work and how do, how do we do that? And so there have been efforts and, and discussions, and, and you'll hear a bit more about how we envision part, partly what we can do. And then recently in uh, Raven and Miller, we understand this need for collecting for gaps. Uh, and we also need infrastructure worldwide uh, in order to help everyone gather the data that we need to do this worldwide. But however, I would, while we're worried about the biodiversity and the, and the need to protect it, and we need to consider also that the humans who do this work are in short supply. And so we need to ask ourselves what to do about that. Pam? So uh, one of the issues that we've discovered in our um, attempts to integrate data relative to or relevant to the COVID-19 situation is that um, there are roadblocks to data access and integration. But it seems that in fact, the roadblocks that we face in this particular situation are really a microcosm of what we face in the larger data landscape. So on the one hand, if we can solve some of these issues for the specific use case, it may be um, that we can make some really good progress toward um, a larger scale data integration as well. And these include some of the topics that we'll hear a little bit more about um, in subsequent um, talks in the session, but things like liberating data from publications. We also heard about that in earlier talks at the conference. 
um, ensuring digital connections between vouchers and the derived genetic sequences from the viruses, development of data standards um, and their impl implementation and adoption and development of long-term networking and alignment. Um, Pam, could you go back one just a second? Sure. So I'd like to add, oh, the other way. <laughs> I hit I hit back there. <laughs> and it, oh, there it goes. Okay. Yeah, I would just like to say too, we were kind of interested to see the, the theme at the bottom of the slide there for the meeting is one that we came up with before this all happened. So <laughs> don't know how we managed that, but yeah, anyway. great okay. point. Yeah. Continuing on, uh, of course, you can imagine that one of the things we did is look for the opportunities to um, where we could find funding to implement some of our ideas. So inspiration came from the CTAF Disco Task Force uh, to mobilize or enhance data that we already have in ways that we thought uh, could help with more information about this potential reservoir. Uh, so you'll hear more about that in the next talk. Pam? Um, another effort that uh, was also inspired by the CTAF Disco um, task force was the really the need to continue our discussions. And so um, we were fortunate to obtain funding from the National Science Foundation for um, a two year workshop grant that really will provide support for a series of workshops that will continue these discussions. Um, and really um, under the attempt, with the attempt of bringing together um, very diverse communities. Oops. So um, a little bit more information about this. We're um, proposing a series of interdisciplinary workshops and the goals are as listed here to continue to identify gaps in biodiversity and pathobiology data connected to bats, coronaviruses and COVID-19 but again, using this as an opportunity to emphasize technical and social issues that could be, um, that need to be resolved for much broader scale questions as well. And to develop possible solutions to close these gaps and enable a more synthetic view um, related to biodiversity and human health, to establish a plan for framing an integrated research agenda and to develop a concept for interdisciplinary training and research. And um, we have, hopes for in-person workshops um, in the coming year, um, possibly um, in, at next year's Tadwig meeting and also at the ADDC summit, um, which if it goes forward in person would be in Washington, DC. We also have though the anticipation of doing a number of, um, of virtual events over the course of the next two years, really with the main goal of removing silos and bridging gaps. Deb. So on the uh, European side of things, we were very excited to see, and this also a, an outcome of discussions at the CTAF Disco Task Force, that um, they got funded to begin digitizing um, bat specimens de novo. Many of these records don't exist yet, so this will be new data for this community. And in addition, you might hear a little bit more about that in the next talk, but we have made an effort on the, from the FSU bat rapid side to include um, these individuals who are leading this effort in our efforts so we can share things like georeferences or people name identifiers, for example, so that their georeferencing and their uh, identification of people and their data enhancement and digitization can go faster. And Pam, I think we can do this one together, but essentially this is a summary of uh, we need to look for ways in which to support the worldwide community to do this. So this is gonna be a, an effort uh, as well as continued work through Tadwick uh, to work on the supporting the trait data and the linking of data. You'll hear a bit more about that in the, on the last talk of the session, uh, as well as further developing the, the model for how to build these networks. Pam? Yeah, so, and I will just add that we identified uh, five major um, areas of emphasis in the Cook et al. Bioscience Viewpoint paper. And um, this essentially summarizes what those are, but there, there's a combination of social science um, goals, as well as infrastructure goals, as well as actual research agenda goals that all um, should be addressed and really are things that the um, Tadwick community could contribute to in, um, in, very, uh, in very good ways. 
So on that, would you like to start? Sure. On that note, for both of us, I think you can, everyone knows here that it takes a collective. Um, and you can see at the last symposium that we just had uh, earlier today, the, the synergy that comes from the many voices from the many different parts of the community that can lend their expertise and knowledge uh, if we can work together. So we'd like to also thank NSF here for their support to do a lot of the things we're, we're now doing uh, and the support from the community and many, many different disciplines coming together to do this. And we need more of that. Pam? Yeah, I would just like to add um, what an inspiring um, set of, uh, well, sort of unfortunate situations, but amazing um, scientific growth that's happened over the last several months as a result of um, these communities coming together. And I will just end by um, noting the uh, diversity of fields that we've listed here as just the beginning of fields that really need to come together, areas that need to come together. And um, finally, I'll mention that um, when those of us who were botanists at one point offered to sort of step back because we were concerned that maybe we were you know, getting in the way, um, our non-botanist colleagues begged us to stay because they uh, thought that it was important to have this uh, broad um, perspective on this problem. And that's really the sort of um, view that we would like to be taking as well, um, that it, it really does take a collective. And we invite all of you to help contribute to this um, effort. Thanks for that. And my, my final thought on that point would be, uh, the, the topic of the bioeconomy, we're all seeing the economic impact of this issue globally and locally. Um, and it's an opportunity, I think, to figure out how we can be part of that conversation, uh, both now and in the future, um, both for protecting, but also helping restore and, and address bioeconomy needs. Thank you. So now I think we have time for maybe one question, maybe two, if there are any, before we go to the next talk. Are there any questions? You do okay. have a few in the Google Doc. Yay. Um, okay. Do you want to take a look Scrolling at them down. or would you yep. like me to read them? I am. We are looking right now. Okay. Conversations. Oh, Pam, the first one is for you. Do you see it yet in the conversations with GenBank? Did it involve best practices for including the catalog number or voucher identifier in a GenBank record? So, um, yeah, great question. So um, we had a really, um, I think, fruitful discussion where we tried to explain to the, um, the folks at GenBank the fact that if, if we could manage to have um, a uh, persistent identifier assigned to each voucher specimen, then it would not be necessary perhaps for people to enter so much of the other information that they tend to need to, or uh, ideally would be entered along with the, um, the specimen name, et cetera. So, you know, currently there are, there's a whole set of ways that a voucher may be referred to. Um, in the GenBank record. Um, what's listed as being preferred is the Darwin Core triplet, but I think probably everyone here knows that those in fact are not unique. So um, there we discussed um, alternatives and suggested that perhaps um, something like a URI would be um, a valuable alternative um, if such a thing were available. And so they were receptive to actually modifying the um, uh, modifying the um, recommendations and the instructions um, rather than making it a requirement, but they would, um, they're open to recommending whatever our community would actually like to uh, recommend to them. And we'll oh, be thank you for the questions Sorry. later. Yes, we have time for questions at the end, so please rest assured we will get to them. Next up, I think it's my turn to share my screen for the next talk. So let me see if I can go to that now.
Hello, my name is Erica Krimmel, and I'm presenting today on a new project funded by the U.S. National Science Foundation to create a data product for the world's specimens of horseshoe bats and relatives. Many of my colleagues listed on this title slide are also with us at Tadwig today, and will be bringing their perspectives to the discussion part of this session. The genesis for this project came from one of our collaborators, Deb Paul who was serving on the ctaf DISCO COVID-19 task force last spring and recognized a need to enhance currently published specimen data in ways that would make it optimally useful for researchers investigating bats as potential vectors for SARS-CoV-2. We know that genomic evidence suggests that the causative virus of SARS-CoV-2 was introduced to humans from horseshoe bats, like the little cutie on this slide, and that species in this family, Rhinolophidae, as well as in closely related Hipposideridae and Rhinonecteridae families, are reservoirs of several SARS-like coronaviruses. We also know that specimens collected over the past 400 years and curated by natural history collections around the world provide an essential reference as we work to understand the distributions, life histories, and evolutionary relationships of these bats and their viruses. While the importance of biodiversity specimens to emerging infectious disease research is clear, empowering disease researchers with specimen data is a relatively new goal for the collections community. We hope to further this goal and assemble the team based primarily at Florida State University and the Yale Peabody Museum, plus partners at Bionomia, the American Museum of Natural History, Arizona State University, and University of Florida. Since July of this year, we've been working to produce this robust data product for researchers studying SARS-like coronaviruses. But beyond the immediate term, we also hope that this project will serve as a model for future rapid data enhancements about biodiversity specimens. To that point, our team is using tools like Slack to facilitate transparency, engagement, and communication between the work we're doing and that of complementary projects, such as the one Nathan will present on later in this session. In this talk, I want to give you a high-level overview of our pipeline and report on our progress to date. The chart here shows milestones and protocols with the green bars representing time spent or expected to spend, and the background color of the row indicating a status of complete, the lightest gray, in progress and yet to begin, the darkest gray. Although much of the specimen-based biodiversity data served by aggregators like IDABio and GBIF is high quality, it hasn't previously been the subject of a data enhancement campaign that leverages standardized protocols and the types of outlier detection enabled by aggregate views of the records. This is what our project is doing and thereby creating efficiencies for the coronavirus research community by producing a more complete, standard, and research-ready data product. Our first milestone was acquiring specimen data, which we did in September of this year. This project underscores the value of biodiversity data aggregators like IDIG Bio and GBIF, which are sources for nearly 90,000 records of horseshoe bat and relative specimens held by over 100 individual natural history collections. The task of acquiring data without aggregators would be immensely more difficult. You can see in the graph on this slide that although the majority of records came from a short list of data providers, there is a significant portion of records curated by this long tail of smaller contributors. As part of this project, we'll be returning enhanced data to each of these contributing collections. And we've also reached out to the top 15 contributors to make them aware of this in advance. For collections who are interested, we have an open invitation to join our project Slack, again with the goal of facilitating transparency, engagement, and communication. One complication of acquiring data from aggregators was that many collections published data to both GBIF and IDIC Bio, and so it was necessary for us to deduplicate records. You might expect that this wouldn't be problematic because GBIF and IDIG Bio are ostensibly acquiring data from the same publishing endpoints like an IPT. But in reality, they're ingesting data on different schedules, and that creates situations where different versions of the same data set exist in each aggregator. Our deduplication protocol is documented and accompanied by code written in R, but basically we determined that we should match records based on a comparison of institution code collection code, catalog number, and occurrence ID. We're aware of instances where this criteria was too strict, and 
uh, where two records representing the same physical specimen weren't merged, but given the potential complexity of solving this problem, we determined to be conservative in asserting that two records were duplicates. In the end, we found that the majority of records are published to both aggregators, but with significant amounts published to only one or the other. Having acquired the data, we began our enhancements with the simple task of ensuring that all unambiguous values for country were assigned ISO three-letter country codes. Both IDIC Bio and GBIF already do this to a certain extent, which meant that we could evaluate data from both the raw and the aggregator enhanced fields for country and country code. There were a total of 805 distinct combinations of values that ended up referring to 125 countries. Where an aggregator had already standardized the country, we trusted their result. And in a few cases, the aggregators came to different conclusions. Um, in these scenarios, GBIF was usually correct. Uh, where possible, we resolved the remaining records manually, although we did have cases where we could not resolve the country, either because the data recorded was too vague or because it referenced a country that no longer exists and doesn't have a modern equivalent in the same geographic footprint. This task is a really good illustration of how automated data cleaning can only take us so far. At this point, we ingested our data set into a forked version of Biospecs, which we're using as a data management solution to maintain data integrity and to facilitate moving subsets of the data in and out for specific protocols that are happening synchronously, e.g. georeferencing, enhancing collector names, resolving dates, etc. Georeferencing collecting localities is a primary activity of this project, and we currently have three excellent data curators, Asia, Katie, and Trevor, working on it. Not only are we adding coordinates and metadata to specimen records that previously lacked this information, but we're also verifying existing georeference data. We are building on community best practices for this protocol, primarily by ground truthing the new georeferencing quick reference guide that Arthur Chapman presented on earlier this week. As we do so, we've been strategizing our georeferencing efforts so that they're efficient while still remaining effective, thanks in large part to the functionality provided by Geolocate. So that's what we've been working on to date, and I'd also like to preview a little of the work that we expect to complete over the next few months. We're collaborating with Nancy Simmons to flag currently unaccepted names, as well as specimens that would represent geographic outliers to a species distribution if the current taxonomic identification is indeed correct. Um, only 30% of the 900 plus distinct values for scientific name present in our data are currently accepted names, which poses a major problem for researchers querying based on taxonomy. Although we won't attempt to actually verify the taxonomic identification of any specimens, as you know, that's, that's best performed on site at the collection. We do believe that we can improve the efficiency of that activity by suggesting nomenclature updates where appropriate. We're also collaborating with David Shorthouse to enhance information about the people in our data. Our objective here is to disambiguate the almost 3,000 distinct name strains associated with collecting or identifying specimen records in this project and to record these results by assigning either an ORCID or Wikidata identifier wherever possible. Bionomia then provides an interface to credit people with the collecting and identifying activities that they participated in, both for records within and external to our dataset. We can use this to inform our georeferencing and our other data enhancement activities and to understand the human community associated with bat collecting over time. We're organizing a December workshop focused on building awareness about bionomia in the bat research community. Um, if you're interested, Deb or David can provide more details in the Q&A portion of this talk. Because we're considering this data set holistically, we can use each of our data enhancement protocols to improve the other's results. For example, on the map here are plotted all of the collecting localities that we've already georeferenced for specimens identified as Rhinolophus arcuatus. The geographic distribution of these points may help us as we work on standardizing taxonomic names, and the information we discover about the people who collected and identified these specimens may help us bo both confirming our georeferencing and our standardizing our taxonomic names. And so as we become increasingly familiar with this data set, 
you know, we hope to describe the intersections of our data enhancement protocols in ways that can scale to include other and more specimen data. As we complete each stage of this project, we're publishing versions of our data product and associated protocols to Zenodo, uh, which functions not only as a repository, but also as a discovery point for making this work accessible to researchers beyond our immediate domains. You can see on the slide here that in the short time we've had this data published, it has been downloaded close to 200 times. By publishing periodic snapshots of our data, we can continue to provide downstream users with increasingly enhanced data in a rapid time frame. And just to show you, in addition to the versioned data product itself, that is the data set of 90,000 or so enhanced specimen records, we're keeping reproducibility in mind by publishing other files associated with our pipeline. These include the raw data from MITIC Bio and GBIF, code associated with each of our data enhancement protocols and the protocols themselves, and where tangential results seem widely relevant, such as a list of the collections providing data to this project, we're providing those as well. So with that, thank you to all the co-authors listed on this talk. Thanks to our stellar uh, Tadwig hosts, um, and thanks to our additional collaborators and all of the collections providing data to this project, as well as the National Science Foundation for providing funding. Thank you, Erica, who did Erica manage to join? I don't even know for sure, but um, Austin, you're here. Would you be willing to take on questions then? Erica's so often. I'm happy, yeah. I'm happy to do it. Yeah. Great. Erica's off in Utah, y'all. If she didn't know it with with bandwidth uh, challenges, so please, Austin. Are there any questions? There have not been any added to that section of the Google Doc, although the list of questions under the previous talk has been very active. Yeah, so we can maybe give people a minute too, or pick up a few of those. Is there anything Austin, you'd like to add to what Erica said while people think of questions? And Nathan has his hand up. Oh, there you go. Um, yeah, yeah, I guess I might've missed the, the summary figure, but I guess I'm wondering what, what it looks like uh, you're gonna be able to liberate in terms of new georeference points for Rhinolophus. Austin, you wanna take that? I, I'm not sure that I can. I, I mean, it sounds like you have a very specific interest in the number of points that you would we are seeing for Rhinolophus as a genus, and I don't have those numbers in front of me. Um, oh, yeah, sorry, horseshoe bats generally. I guess I was. Yeah, I'm not. I mean, I, you, you guys are looking at three families, right? Yeah, my connection is unstable. Deb, do you want to address sure. that question? Sure, I'll give it a shot. Um, in general, uh, we can also point you to some uh, resources where you can look at that uh, for yourself, Nate. But um, in those 89,000 records, I think there was something like uh, 10,000 or so distinct locality strings. But when I say distinct, that's, you know, they could be different by a dot or something, right? But it's the clustering algorithms of geolocate and other that then make that a little bit smaller. So we are looking at existing georeferences as well. And evaluating those, but new ones, I would guess we're adding somewhere in the thousands, maybe 5,000 something. That's a ballpark. Does that help? Is that kind of what you were asking? And yeah. You do have questions coming through the Google Doc now. Yay. So help me. Is that Dimitri's question? What's the timeline of the current period of the task force? Yes. Uh, yeah. So hold on, I'm letting the chat. Okay. Um, we have one year. The task force, well, sorry, am I in the right place? Yeah, the, the COVID 19, the CTAF Disco Task Force, that's a different question. Um, the current grant that Erica just talked about, we have until next June, July, I believe, August to finish it. Did we start in September? I think Austin's got to rejoin. I think we have essentially about nine months left, nine or 10. But I think we'll be done before that. Yeah. Um, Quentin asks, 
is there much evidence in the data that tells you which species of bat cohabit? These would be useful data for epidemiology and ecology of bats and their parasites. So, we, uh, Austin, are you back? Do you want to answer? Or? I, um, I, yeah, I, I can't say that we have done that analysis yet, but it is something that is also of interest to people who are modeling the uh, spillover events so that they have good data on where humans and bats are cohabitating, um, you know, the same space. I don't know that that's getting at the question, the answer to the question that you're interested in, Quentin, but uh, we have yet to complete the georeferencing, although we're probably between a quarter and a half done. And, we should be able to address some of some of the answer to that soon. So we are engaging with people like Nancy Simmons and, and, and Nate and others with the to look at the data at the end to see if we can do things like are there range extensions or, for example, community that you were alluding to, Quentin, that we could illuminate with the new data. Um, Yorit, can you elaborate? on how you're planning to integrate your enhancements with providing collections. Have you done prototype test runs? Excellent question. No, we have not. Um, the initial bit on my part was to make sure we initiate a conversation with the collections from the start to let them know what we were doing to their data and when not, not just waiting till the end of the project and saying, oh, here, by the way. Um, and this meant also talking to them and meeting with them a little bit if they were interested so we could learn more about their collection management software and what their needs are gonna be. And so we have some inkling of that so that we're going to give them back at least data you it as best we can in a format that they can take advantage of or be prepared to be prepared for because they have this lead time. Yeah, that's a great question. And um, we have a stated goal of producing for Zenodo a Darwin Core Archive, a frictionless data package and shape files that are end products for the, the work that we're doing. Um, somebody help us keep on time here. I'm looking at the questions. I'm not looking at the clock. We still have um, two minutes. Thanks, Holly. Donut asks, why not include scholarly taxonomic publications in projects like this? Because it's the ultimate opinion of a scientist about a specimen and a taxon. Um, Donut, we could talk again about how we might have thought about doing that from the beginning. Certainly the, the goal here was to take published data and figure out what we could do to enhance it, uh, which is to say that the facts that are already presented to us, how can we further develop the, their presence? Um, so I'm not sure how we would do that, but you might have ideas. Um, I'm sure. Austin, do you want to add to that? I don't. It's a fine idea. I mean, it's a it's an important idea and um, one that I hope is completed. But we had to maintain some. Um, you know, we had to make, define a scope that was relevant. Uh, possible to um, make progress on in a rapid amount of time. And um, so we, we drew it, the line where we drew the line. And um, in the future, I would encourage people to consider that point. It's a great point. Um, and Nathan, to your question, is the digitization of relevant field notes part of this? No, like I said, we're using the data that's been published. We don't have access to the original we're not taking the time, we're not going to the collections and saying, hey, can you, do you have field notes for this? No, the idea would be taking what you can get from the aggregator and seeing what we can do to, to, to go from there. All right, I think we have to go, is our time up? Yes. Yes. Go to the next. The so, yeah, now it's Nate's turn and we can come back to the rest of the questions. Thanks everybody, great questions. Cool. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm coming to you live from uh, Stanley Field Hall at the Field Museum. Um, if, if only, right? If only we could be in museums again. Um, instead, I'm in my house. And we'll share my screen here. Is that looking good? You guys can see everything? Okay. Cool. So yeah, and I'm, it's, I'm honored to be able to speak to you today on, on behalf of our, um, our knowledge hub that has been part of this uh, CETAF DISCO COVID-19 task force that's been mentioned already. So um, it's a number of contributors here, as you can see on the screen. Um, and really, our goal has been to provide this sort of 
this you know, connection point where we can really concentrate mammal host virus information. And so this is um, obviously a pretty intense moment in history, right? Um, this, this idea of viral spillover risk from mammals to humans is on everyone's mind to a greater extent than it ever has been. Um, this, is, this has been a problem before, obviously with MERS and, and SARS and Ebola, but um, your average person has not been thinking about it very much. And so the, the way in which viruses have been studied has been largely without the mammal hosts of those viruses. Uh, this is a, both a historical artifact because it's been mostly virologists that are studying viruses. Um, and because uh, maybe we haven't been doing a good enough job in the museum community of really insert, inserting uh, the role of hosts and so wildlife host reservoirs have really been neglected in this process. The interesting thing here is that viruses are not free living, right? Viruses cannot generate ATP. They cannot replicate without uh, eukaryotic cells or I guess prokaryotic cells too. Um, and so they're like to, to neglect the host reservoirs is, is clearly a problem. And so where we came into this, forming this task force in April 2020, uh, obviously the, the new the novel coronavirus, thinking, you know, initial data pointing to horseshoe bats, in particular rhinolophus, but sort of unclear other than that. And we had these, you know, these major questions, you know, how did the viral spillover occur? Which, which host species? We felt like one question that we could really contribute to was trying to understand this risk of future spillover events. Uh, and, and in particular, you know, which mammal groups would uh, indeed house the most viruses and have the potential to pass them to humans. And so with this goal and, um, you know, multiple experts for, for bats and other mammals on our team, including Nancy Simmons at the American Museum, uh, you know, we set out to, to liberate some host virus data and quickly ran into the same problem that the whole world was running into, which was that you know, we were all on lockdown and so was the museum. So were all the rare books. And Nancy has a great library in her office, but she actually couldn't access it. And so this is a, it's really like a, a siren call for biodiversity science in general. We can't rely on just being able to retrieve knowledge from physical objects. It needs to be digital. And so really we were talking about liberating biodiversity data generally, right? So we have um, you know, all these, all these locked documents uh, and, and just things that are offline, things that are not connected, um, things that are locked in PDFs as well. And so this idea of dark data ends, ends up being kind of an important way to talk about this, right? So we have, you know, we have bio collections, all kinds of different observations of organisms housed in those bio collections from specimens to tissues, and then, you know, DNA is also being a type of physical evidence. And then, you know, only a portion of this is, has been digitized and is in digital databases, you know, the, the GBIFs and the NCBIs of the world. Um, but really that's just, that's just data, it's not knowledge. And so there was this, you know, this important point that really to have digital knowledge, we need to connect it into a graph where we can um, you know, have these annotations, kind of a, an, an RDF triple, if you're familiar with that, of like A is X to B, right? So this virus is hosted by this bat, which eats this insect and nests in this palm tree, but the bat also roosts in the palm tree. And there's evidence that we can point to for each of those interactions. And so this idea of a knowledge graph um, is, has been bounced around the last few years. Certainly uh, Rod Page has been developing it, um, including in a talk earlier in, in TEDWIG this year. And there's this, this idea that Wikidata actually could be a, a really great resource for this a a paper that was published earlier this year in eLife. The approach we've been taking has been based on the, uh, the open bio div framework and kind of this, this idea that you know, linked open data is really what we need to be connecting and that there's sort of these two different approaches, right? With the, the Plotsy approach where we are liberating old data, existing data that's been published. And then the Pensoft approach where 
uh, we really want to be publishing new data in, in these semantically enriched formats that are already tagged with the specific interaction terms that can be easily parsed and connected into knowledge graphs. And so there's this, you know, rather uh, prescient quote from 2006 by Tim Berners-Lee is the unexpected reuse of information, which is the value added by the web. So he's, I mean, he's obviously a visionary about the internet in general, but this becomes uh, especially poignant in the, in the case of uh, zoonotic virus spilling over. This is exactly the type of instance where we need, where we have an unexpected reuse of information and we need it as soon as the event happens, ideally to predict uh, the risk of these events happening in the future. And so our goal has been to build a host virus knowledge graph, specifically in regards to mammals and viruses. And um, kind of what this looks like from the, from the Platzi side of things in, in particular is digitizing, extracting, and indexing known biodiversity data uh, stemming from physical specimens and, and described in taxonomic treatments. So if we kind of walk through what our, our workflow looks like. So, you know, we have this initial knowledge, this initial event. We have coronaviruses and horseshoe bats, um, which are evidenced by physical specimens and described in taxonomic treatments. And then to digitize those treatments by, by scanning and extracting them um, and then annotating those, those scan treatments uh, using a, a custom metadata that we developed in Zenodo. So this is, these are processes that are being run kind of under the Platzi umbrella of, of Sino species, which houses the RDF triples, Ocellus, which houses the, uh, the images that are extracted from these treatments, and then um, within, within Zenodo as a storage house. And sort of the idea here that we've developed is, um, you know, this this taxonomic intelligence that ends up being built by by connecting these treatments and their and their underlying evidence is really the key that we need to unlock dark data. So, in particular, for interactions, if we can use taxonomic names and their meanings to search um, text in general, even free text. Uh, and then pull out associated evidence and uh, identities of uh, hosts and viruses. We'll, we'll be doing, we'll be doing well. And so that's that's been sort of our approach here of, of trying to link this together into a knowledge graph. Sort of the other approach that I mentioned before is that this knowledge can be born connected with semantic publishing. It's already linked. It doesn't require all these additional steps. And so it's really the way that that we need to go in the future. So the results of uh, our task force over the last few months, um, we've, as I mentioned, built this, this custom metadata on Zenodo that allows for interaction terms to be directly annotated onto articles. And as a sort of pilot of this, the uh, coronavirus host community was formed, or, or COVIHO, which um, already annotated 165 different articles with over 1,000 interactions. So you can go on, um, this, this PDF will be uh, uh, part of the, the TEDRIG documents and you can click on these links or we can put them in the, in the chat. Uh, also, Platzi liberated a, a bunch of taxonomic treatments specific to, to bats and um, entire mammal catalogs, the, the Rhinolophidae of Handbook of the Mammals of the World. And then from Pensoft, uh, over 35,000 interactions were already able to be liberated just from the existing interaction tables from, from semantic publishing. And so here's a, here's a look at what the, the images that come out of the digitized treatments kind of looks like, a, sort of an overview. Donut had an uh, even more beautiful photo in his talk earlier in the week. Um, these are all specific to, to this particular data liberation effort. So we're getting maps, images, evidence. And then in Globy, this is, so Globy ends up being sort of the, the, the storage, the centralization place, not, not necessarily a storage, um, but sort of connecting of all these different resources. And so that information was being fed in from Zenodo via Platzi and Pensoft, and then um, you know, add to other data sources that Globy had 
had centralized. This DBAT beer and DROD beer are, are sort of uh, curated versions of NCBI virus, and in some cases contain additional information. And so here's an example actually um, that, that Yorit put together that is specific to the rhinolophus horseshoe bats. And so this is showing in black, it's showing the viruses, the blue is the rhinolophus, and then red is other, other taxa. So I think some of these are parasites, some of them might be food sources, um, but you can actually go and browse this with, the, with this link on the screen um, later on. And so this is the, the data that we have uh, liberated. It's all centralized in the Zenodo repository. Uh, we just pushed another update to it uh, last week, maybe two weeks ago. And uh, it's, it's, already, it's getting downloaded. It is a useful resource, it appears. And um, we're going to keep going forward with this. Just to summarize what, what this shows, um, we in total, uh, out of this, this data set from Globi, it comes from all these other sources, almost 150,000 total interactions, including ecological interactions. And then if we subset that to these three different interaction types and search for virus, um, and specific to mammals too, I should, I should mention, we, uh, we get 50,000 different interactions. And then if we subset that to unique uh, name combinations of mammals and, and viruses after looking at synonymies, it's, it's about 4,000 interactions. And um, interestingly, when we compare this to the, one of the most recent compilations of host and virus data for mammals, um, it's an improvement, right? I mean, in particular, uh, it's, it's an improvement um, for, for mammals and we can, well, it, it, we can be most confident about the improvement for mammals at least. Um, we have a good synonym list for mammals that we can check this against. Uh, we're, we're much more confident in, in the, the mammal identifications, about a 19% increase. With the virus names, we really need to develop um, a virus synonym list that um, can help us re remove some of this redundancy. There's a lot of viruses that just sort of are named by ID numbers or slight variants in the names. Um, so this is an area for future work. So our next steps with this is uh, really to analyze the phylogenetic dimension of, of viral, viral spillover risk. We have the benefit of this new mammal phylogeny that I was involved with putting together. Um, so we, we, we can, for the first time, really look at uh, the species level, uh, species specific zoonotic risk uh, uh, across mammals and viruses. And so that's, that's gonna be pretty exciting and really try and get at this question of the risk of future spillover events. And so this phrasing this in terms of taxon specific zoonotic risk ends up being a useful concept going forward. And in particular, that this sort of hypothesis that, that bats are the, the special reservoirs for, for viruses has been the longstanding hypothesis, but it's recently been challenged. Uh, a paper that was published earlier this year in PNAS by Molens and Stryker um, kind of claimed that this neutral hypothesis was actually supported where it's just proportion, in proportion to species richness of the mammal host, the number of viruses they have. But really, we, the data quality that we have is, is not sufficient to address this on any kind of level um, beyond the, the taxonomic order level. And really, we, we want to be drilling into at least to gen genera, if not families, and ideally to thinking about species. Um, and certainly, so we're, we're just not there yet. And so a, a future direction with this too is to be adding sort of uncertainty of information about these interactions. And so you, you might've noticed that we had these, these colored lines um, in the host virus knowledge graph that I showed you earlier. And so the idea here is that we really wanna get at the confidence of host viral, uh, sorry, host reservoir um, status for, for a given mammal and a given virus. And really what, what this boils down to is looking at whether antibodies were used, which are were not, not very specific, whether live virus was found, um, what type of genes, was it just a short gene fragment, was it a whole viral genome, and really assigning confidence scores. 
Similarly with the taxonomic assignments, a lot of these uh, mammal hosts are identified maybe to genus, just as Rhinolophus spa, or in some cases is just identified as bat. And that doesn't mean we can't use that information. We just need to assign a, a sort of different confidence weighting. Um, and similarly, the, some, some viruses are just identified as coronavirus. So ultimately what, what we wanna get at is this sort of probabilistic host virus knowledge graph where we have uh, you know, information about both the interactions and the host identity and the virus identity. And we can really get at more intelligent uh, predictions, including using, using AI tools uh, for, for predicting taxon specific zoonotic risk. And then um, really publishing this data for reuse. And Globy is an, an excellent tool, not only for publishing for reuse, but also um, like a quality checkpoint going forward. So just to summarize the, the, the lessons of, of this, this effort, you know, we've got these, these two main approaches for old data and new data. And really, you know, we, we can liberate data from, the, from, from existing publications, but it's you know, highly complex, it's expensive, and it really doesn't scale. So we have to push publishers to expand semantic, you know, this Pensoff style publishing, uh, if we wanna make progress in understanding biotic interactions. And then really that, um, you know, as Pam and Deb mentioned, it's been a, a real pleasure, you know, working with this group of people during, during an otherwise very difficult time during the pandemic. Um, we, we really think that this type of an effort is a, is a great example of, you know, what, what can happen when we have a common cause and when we can motivate this type, these type of re reforms in biodiversity data by uh, real world needs. So we, we think this is a, an opportunity to rethink the, w the way we do science. And with that, I'd like to, to thank everyone, um, in particular, everyone from the task force and for you all for listening. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Nate. That was really great. Um, there, people are starting to put some questions in and we'll invite you to continue to do so. Um, let's see. So there, there was some discussion, Nate, about um, the uh, Zenodo annotations. Uh, Yurit has um, replied to that, but um, it might be an opportunity while we're waiting for some more um, questions for some discussion about that. Katya Saltman asked, can you say more about the Zenodo annotations? What does that look like? And Yurit replied um, about um, being able to find the thread that developed the feature at a link. And then he gave a specific example, but I'm wondering if anyone might want to um, just comment on what is actually behind those links. Hmm. So Europe might want to say something there or do not. Go ahead. Yeah, in Zenodo, you can in, in, insert custom metadata. That means you can insert data which is based on existing vocabularies. So in this case, we used the oval, the biotic interactions vocabulary, and inserted all these biotic links. And that means in Zenodo, you can make very, very specific uh, repositories that can be harvested because you can export this in, uh, in JSON or whatever format you need. I will post a link to a couple of examples. Great, thank you. Um, so Quentin makes a comment, the more we add interactions to Globy, the more we seem to find uh, we really need to need a push to close the interactions gap. Even for bats, we are just scratching the surface. And um, the, the numbers that you gave, Nate, just in terms of uh, what, what you and your group have discovered um, relative to the uh, previously published paper um, shows an increase in taxa and also presumably a large increase in interactions as well. Did you want yeah, to comment sorry, on that? Sorry, just um, before I address that, the, I was showing, I shared my screen again. Here's an example of one of these um, Coviho annotations, right? So you this custom metadata here where we got host of with uh, a bat and a virus and there's a handful just in this one paper. There is a whole bunch of papers in this coronavirus host community though. 
So this is an example of, you know, we could go through and annotate all kinds of literature um, from PubMed, including, and then, and then be digitizing literature. Um, this is, a, this is a, a great way forward potentially. Then, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, Pam, you, you were sort of asking another question about, about the liberated data. Oh, so um, Quentin had made the comment about the, um, basically the more we add interactions to Globy, the more we seem to find we really need a push to close the interactions gap. Even for bats, we are just scratching the surface. And um, I, was, I was just commenting that the number of um, both uh, mammals and viruses that you reported from through your analysis were larger than what had been reported in the, um, you know, even in a recent publication. Yeah. So, and that um, definitely supports the observation that Quentin was making. So I was just wondering if you could just comment on that a little bit more. Yeah, no, I, th I think for sure there's, um, we're just gonna keep finding more. I mean, we had that depiction of, you know, dark data versus what's, what's known, I mean, it's hard to estimate how much dark data there is, but I, th I think the analogy to like dark matter in physics, right? Like scientists know that it exists, F physicists know it exists, um, but we can't quite measure it. Um, and so like uh, getting these taxonomic keys as we called them, right? Like um, in quotations for, of, of, you know, linked taxonomic treatments, really getting all the names out of taxonomic treatments and, and their associated meanings with evidence We'll be able to, you know, really go fishing in in any data that is digitized, and pull out these interactions. And um, Dimitri goes on to make some uh, comments about the importance of having these interaction data for all sorts of um, basic biological understanding. Deb, do you see some other questions here that we want to um, continue with? Or Dimitri, would, did you want to comment on that further? I, I think it would be great if Dimitri comments and we go back and look at some of the earlier questions we didn't get to. But I want to make sure Dimitri gets to say what GBIF is up to. Yeah, thanks. Um, I didn't uh, really plan to steal the, the spirit of the discussion. So the session closed at uh, 8.30. Do you want me to do it now? So um, I just... Um, oh. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me well? Yeah. Um, okay. So um, in the in the GBIF governing board, which uh, just finished uh, yesterday, uh, we got our next work program approved, and that includes the continuation of our yet invisible but soon visible work on the zoonotic diseases. So I just wanted to let everybody know here that uh, we will start a task group of experts, which will probably enforce what is going on here. Uh, and uh, so um, uh, you know that GBF is not the fastest organization when it comes to kind of new features, new data types and so on. Also our governance is a little bit slow. So, so we, 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 we can do some things with our data model today. And uh, our stakeholders, GBIF countries, uh, agreed to, that there is an acute need to increase the coverage of the taxa uh, associated with human health risks of the of the vectors and so on and so on. So this is this is not yet as advanced as presented in the sessions. It doesn't yet include interactions data and so on and so on. But we we see the ongoing demand for as simple things as occurrences of mosquitoes. People come to GBIF in search of these data and they don't find enough. So in response of this demand, there will be a task group on data mobilization of the classical GBIF supported data types. And I think you will hear soon from your GBIF nodes and from central GBIF as well, that uh, there'll be a mobilization campaign or a series of campaigns. So um, we hope that this will complement the efforts in the COVID-19 task force with bats, but we'll probably focus on something else such as mosquitoes, uh, maybe mollusks and sand flies and things like this, because Obviously, COVID is not the only human health related problem in the world, and we don't know what is next. I think it will be a longer term, maybe slightly slower um, activity, but I just wanted to make this announcement uh, here. And uh, Quentin and the Paloma, who are on this call, they are part of this group. There will be a series of consultations and so on and so on. So I will make sure that it's all available through gbif.org, and you will hear more about that. Thanks, Thanks for, for letting me say that. 
Well, and thanks for adding Thank that dimension to the conversation. It's marvelous. So Pam, can we pick up maybe going back to the beginning with some of the questions we didn't really get to bring up? Yeah, there was, I think there's one unanswered question for, um, uh, well, either for Austin or Deb. Um, and that was from Lauren. Um, you may have covered this already. Was there a gap analysis of what collections out there not in existing data sets? Um, in other words, what are, what are or might we be missing in terms of your, um, your georeferencing and record I, enhancement? Um, I don't think so. I think that will come after. I think we'll probably be able to look at what's missing after we do this because we'll have a better but, idea of what we have. Deb, wasn't it the case that the Europeans took stock of what they haven't had digitized and have a new grant to do it? Yeah, but I'm not sure they did it any, they just did the same thing as us. They just basically said, go count all your rhinal office, all your, the same three groups as us. They didn't try to do gap as in, we should focus on this group because we already have these other ones. I don't think, if I'm understanding that right. They did it, and they didn't focus on, uh, they might've done, maybe somebody here's on that that can answer that question. They might've done some questions about um, geographic scope. I think that the answer to the question as it is in regards to our project is no, we didn't. Um, we just took the data that was currently being served at the aggregators and ran with that. Um, my, my sense of the Euro European project is that there is new data being created um, of the type that we're in the process of enhancing, but we're not thinking of looping back around and picking that up, we've more or less with the drawbridge up and we're working with the data that we're working with as of September. So um, I hope that answers the question. Um, going back to questions after Deb's and my presentation, um, I think we've um, managed to comment on just about all of them. Um, both Nate and Christian had um, comments about um, about botanists <laughs> either having things figured out or having the benefit of um, flat specimens for digitization. And um, so there were um, just a few of those additional comments there. I'm looking uh, to see if there's anything else that hasn't been addressed. I do Deb, know the address. Ahead. Well, I wanted to say just I, Quentin's question number three strikes me as something I wanted to keep coming back to, you know, is do you think the pandemic will help people understand that we are part of nature and bound by its restrictions, or are we likely to want to try to separate from it more? And I think Nate's point and his gorgeous illustrations of those relationships to help us visualize the issue are something we need to continue to do with the general public. Um, and I don't know the answer, Clinton, except more work and more help maybe from different kinds of groups to help us message. Um, what does it take to socialize our science? Do you all have other ideas? Who should we be reaching out to help us do this? So um, maybe while we wait for other people to jump in, um, it is the, the part of the mission of the One Health Initiative to, um, you know, to integrate across biodiversity to, um, you know, and all other relevant aspects of human health. And so I think that there should be a, ready and willing partner in sharing this message. Um, how, how well this message actually is getting out to anyone in the you know, non-scientific arena, I think is a, um, a big question. So uh, I think, yeah, I think, I think there is potential, but we definitely need some help. Yeah, I, I guess I could follow up Pam and, and Deb. The, the, certainly the, the idea of, of a knowledge graph should be in the One Health community's mind, and I'm not sure that it is right. Like, a, and we, mm -hmm. that's that's probably our job to to fix. Um, and I guess I wonder, like, you can imagine some sort of really complex, interesting, nuanced knowledge graph. Would that convince people in the general public that we're part of nature? I mean. It, I don't, I'm not, I'm not, I don't actually know. I think we, we need to be a little more creative than, than to just like say, here, look at the, look at the data, right? Like we need to be able to tell stories with it. Right. 
Yeah, I think um, communications um, experts would need to take that and pa sort of package the knowledge in a way that could be, um, you know, more accessible to the public. So Lauren had another question that I think probably goes, well, it could go either to Austin and Deb or to Nate. Um, has someone got a stash of bat specimens in a little rural museum somewhere that might reveal a lot that we aren't currently considering? And so I think, you know, gap analysis in the sense of collections, you know, aggregated collections or individual collections, as opposed to the um, taxonomic specimens. Maybe yeah, I, it's an good. It's an important question, and I think one that um, isn't going to be obvious by the generation of data about what we already know about. I mean, it's something that needs to be um, discovered in surveys of the community because you know the product that we're going to arrive at, at the end of our, our work at FSU and Yale is is not going to be something that will have obvious gaps in it that are the size and shape of the hole that that collection could fill and those will be obvious to us we we really do need it to be a, a survey of the community um, to get an answer to that question it's a, it's an excellent point it, it goes directly to why we need a collection descriptions for collections and we need to engage and get the small ones and help them get their descriptions in there lauren uh so that we we can know that those exist um that's super important Deb, it's also the collections that are not already in central repositories like GBIF, right? I mean, I'm thinking about the collections in Southeast Asia, mm -hmm. in China, that sure. um, are really relevant to these spillovers. Yeah. And there's a lot of work in different, like um, Dimitri's work, to mobilize, help Russia mobilize their data. Um, and GBIF has definitely vested interest in continuing to try to do that. Yeah, good. But we can all play a role depending on who we collaborate with in that sphere of influence if we happen to have connections, right? There's some more questions, right, Pam? I think I see a good yeah, one from so your. There, yeah, there are a number of new ones arising in the, in the chat that haven't made it into the Google Doc yet. And um, James has had his hand up for a bit as well. Oh, oh, sorry, I don't have the participants open right now. Maybe, um, James, go ahead and then um, I'll get back to the this next list in a second. Sorry about that. Thanks, uh, Pam. I'm actually just echoing what you said. No one had said the One Health piece, right? And, and especially those of us who work for government and mandate-driven departments, uh, One Health is very important. Uh, but I think that the, going back to the thing that I started about botanists and mycologists are important, I, I, think, we, I think we have a bigger picture here that, that keeps us relevant. And this point was driven home at the GBIF governing board by my director and others. Uh, and Dag is very, very familiar with this and others of us. But uh, agriculture, man, uh, you have to think about plants and fungi host those interactions, the host problem. We've had major famines that have done way more dents to people in the past than uh, COVID will do. So uh, we, and that reality is real and not going away as our population grows. So I think we, yes, COVID is the thing of the moment. There's no doubt of that, but we have major contributions we could make to other world problems. So just to keep that in mind. Yeah, great point. Um, let's see. So Talia asked a question that I think um, goes potentially, maybe mostly to Nate. Um, don't the literature occurrences duplicate the museum records that are already pulled from GBIF? How much, um, how much overlap is there in those, um, in those data resources? This was brought up a little bit yesterday, this like idea of like, basis of record, right? Um, yeah, I, I, I think um, my understanding was that the, the, the literature is referring to the museum record. And so it's not an actual occurrence. It's just like a, a, a record of an occurrence. Or, I, don't, I don't know right. how you saw it. You're, well, what you're struggling with is the fact that the standard doesn't do what we need it to do. And yeah. there need to be some changes made. So what's been happened is those two things end up being if you search, you get a, you get a bunch of literature references to and you're not understanding why and what ends up looking like duplicates. So it's it's a matter of us changing how we do that. And I think that you heard in that that scenario, was it Marcus Theodoti, if I said his name yeah. right? Yeah. I think he heard us and was understanding that we need to do some work about. And it's possible that basis of record will go away in the distant future. Something else will replace it. So we'll avoid that problem. 
to Leah for the meanwhile. That does mean people are going to be confused, though, as long as we do it that way when they download data. You know, that, that would be an obvious place to find the gaps, so to speak, because there may be reference to specimens in the literature that aren't appearing yet as um, the basis of, um, you know, spe specimen based data coming into uh, the aggregators. A, a similar thing that could be done, and again, this isn't something that you could do from the data that we're generating, but uh, Bionomia would be able to potentially predict missing collections from collectors. That is, if you have a, a very prolific collector that's collecting bats up until a particular point, and then uh, there's a long gap in which they're not collecting and you have more collections later, that suggests that there's something that's not been digitized yet and it's, it, it would fill that picture. And so yeah, those are two ideas to uh, begin to get at the gaps. I saw Joe had his uh, hand up at one point. Would you like to go ahead, please? Yeah, you got me all excited with the uh, the clustering. So I put a link in the, the chat. Uh, so we have a, a new clustering algorithm. Uh, and the example that I put there is a is an ant specimen from Cal Academy without an image. Uh, but there's also a reference uh, from a, a, a literature citation of that very refer of that very specimen uh, via Plazi. And, and then there is an eyeball uh, occurrence as well with an image and a DNA sequence attached to it. That's all from the same specimen, but it's three different types of data. We can cluster them together. Then the next challenge is to get that all together in all three places, but it's uh, very exciting that we can bring those three ideas together. Great, thanks. We have about three minutes left until we're scheduled to um, end. Do we want to ask your question out loud? Because I think it's a valid one as well. And it shows what we just kind of did. You know, current funding models foster competition. How do you think this affects our shared goal of creating integrated knowledge graphs? Tuffy question. Your, you can speak. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah you, you, you asked a question uh, perfectly, I think. Um, and um, I think it's uh, maybe a time to reflect on why we didn't, why, why we don't have integrated data sources currently. Because the technology we've been using has been around since the, I could argue, since the 70s. Yeah. So why is this not happening? And I'm, I'm wondering whether we should address the elephant in the room, which is funding. So, and I was wondering whether other people uh, see the same elephant that I see. Yeah, but funding in the in the publication model of for profit, right? I mean, the I think if if there was a profit margin in connecting data, then it would it would be happening, right? Yeah, so I, I think the, the silence sort of uh, you, tells me something, right? Well, anyway. I think the silence tells you that it's difficult. That's right. what people exactly. don't have an answer because it's difficult. Yes. Um, you know, we've had microcosms of this that are getting worked on where, you know, we've tried to do a workshop across a federal and a non-federal group and had trouble because we can't put our money in the same bucket. And, and that's at the workshop level. And so magnify that at the grant level, um, trying to figure out how to do that so that countries and regions can work together effectively um, and mobilize around this kind of task, I, I would think. Uh, it'll be interesting if it comes up from the GBIF model of trying to do sort of a, a global initiative, a grand challenge kind of thing. So I can, I can maybe add a few words about that. So uh, for the task group we're putting together, um, screening funding opportunities will be, will be one clear task. And I think this funding should be indeed used collaboratively and we should align our efforts uh, here. And one, one thing, which is kind of a classical Tadwick trap, I put it on the notes as well, that there, Tadwick is a great research and development unit 
collective, communal. Uh, so many good ideas are generated, fantastic tools are demoed, everything is linked to everything. But then oftentimes this is where the fun ends. Yes, you made your Tadwick presentation, everybody applauds, but then nobody comes to use it. I mean, not always, many, many great tools with, with the solid user base. And I don't want to be like super beater here, but I think we need to find and very actively communicate with actual user communities. This is why I'm excited that in our task group will be people uh, closely connected to WHO. Uh, so I think like the horses uh, in front of this data carriage, they should be research questions. They should be concrete data needs, bring us these kind of interactions, bring us these sort of names or this kind of occurrence data. Then we can do things otherwise impossible. So I think I, it's, it's perhaps the reflection that Tadwick is clearly and for a good reason dominated by kind of developer excitement. Like, oh, we can do these fantastic things with our data tools, let's do them. And I think what, what like the, the expertise which I think we're missing in our community is some sort of um, a user, user marketer, marketing specialist, somebody who knows the field from inside and who, who can, help us identify the clusters of research questions for which we could provide relevant services and relevant data content. Otherwise, we'll be inventing things that maybe half of them are not needed. I mean, I'm not the research and development specialist. Maybe this is the way it should be. Like, let's produce 20 tools, one of them will work. But I'm not sure we have time for that. So I, I think we like what we will try, and I hope that this group here in Tadwick will join us in this effort, we'll try to identify these particular spectrums of today's research questions, which are data hungry. So did you, and I don't know if you caught that in our presentation, but one of the CTAF Disco task force groups was doing exactly that for this narrower topic, yes. right? So, um, so, so we want to replicate that with, uh, with other diseases and taxa, like with malaria, yellow fever, and so on and so on. So going beyond COVID, that is, uh, mm -hmm. that is uh, the motto. So we've reached our time, I believe. Everybody, yes, am I right? And we are a little tiny bit over. So we appreciate you uh, being kind about still staying with us. If you need to go, we understand. Um, I think it's time for us to wrap up, but I was gonna give Pam a chance to have final thoughts. I just wanna say we have one more social hour left at this event coming up this evening. Hope to see many of you there and to thank you all for um, your attendance at Tadwig this week and the session today. And uh, Pam, maybe we need to say something too, although I'm not sure about follow-ups or questions, ideas, and how to contact us. So your turn. Okay. So I'd just like to thank um, our speakers and um, all of the members of the various task forces that um, we were discussing in terms of their work. And many of those members are actually here as participants um, in the session. So thanks to, to those of you for joining and for contributing in terms of um, discussion, raising questions, answering questions, and, and for all of your great work. Um, I'd also like to um, note that there are uh, multiple efforts um, arising to sort of drive some of these um, collaborations forward. So there's um, an effort in the EU for development of a, a new proposal that will um, help to continue some of the, um, the discussions and help to foster research interactions. Uh, we hope through um, the workshop grant that Deb and I have that we can also contribute to broader dialogue and help again to foster collaborations. So um, if you have ideas for a workshop, a virtual workshop at this point, but a workshop or um, a webinar or anything like that, please get in touch and uh, we'd be happy to uh, work out um, how we can best support those efforts. And finally, I will mention that Viral Muse now has some uh, web, um, some URLs. Uh, we bought some domains uh, this week. So there will be websites, um, viralmuse.org, viralmuse.net, and viralmuse.com were all purchased. Um, we're probably gonna go with the .org, but you should be able to, um, in the not too distant future, get a better idea of what that group is doing as well. And again, I just like to uh, thank all of our tech support for really um, awesome uh, help and work. Um, thanks to um, everyone at Tadwig for allowing us to um, go ahead and, and uh, 
put this symposium on and thanks again to our speakers and for all of your participation. It's really been great um, from my perspective. So thank you.